Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. My wife and I attended a fancy celebration a few weeks ago. The party was sponsored by our company, Ribbled Consulting Inc., highlighting a recent accomplishment by one of the firm's older executives. It was a high-priced affair, held at the ballroom of a local Hilton hotel. As usual at this type of event, my wife was dressed appropriately in a classic little black dress, sleeveless and short to display her lovely legs, and low cut in the front to reveal a bit of cleavage. I wore a plain dark blue suit, with a white shirt and tie, which seemed to be the uniform of many of the men in attendance. We made the rounds as we entered the huge room. I have to admit I was impressed by how many people were there. It seemed there were over 200 people there already, and more arriving every minute. I knew that Ribbled Consulting was in a very lucrative business. It was clear it had grown quickly over the past year, but I never expected there would be hundreds of employees and their guests in the huge, expensively decorated ballroom. Sarah had worked for Ribbled for over a decade, so I knew a few of her co-workers from past parties. We entered the party as many people greeted her and smiled in recognition. She seemed to know everyone, and as we made the rounds, Sarah introduced me to her friends from work that I didn't know. When the host of the event asked for everyone to take their seats, we took our assigned seats at a large round table near the front. As soft music played over the loudspeaker, we spoke with the people at our table. Most were younger than us, but they seemed friendly and soon I was having a good time chatting with people, while listening to my wife interacting with the people she knew from work. After a delicious steak dinner, Sarah and I sat through a few boring speeches which proclaimed the honored older man's efforts in securing some lucrative contract. Once the formalities were finished, no doubt to enable the firm to write off the evening's cost as a business expense. The CEO of Sarah's firm welcomed the gathering and invited everyone to enjoy the evening dancing to the band and drinking from the free bar in the corner of the spacious room. The band started out with a few oldies, and I was glad of that. I was afraid they would start playing some annoying rap music, but thankfully they didn't. As the band struck up a slow song I recognized, I took my wife's hand and whispered in her ear. Shall we dance, my dear? Sarah looked around to make sure we weren't the first to break the ice. Then she nodded with a smile and I escorted my attractive wife out to the floor. There were already a dozen couples dancing, so we just blended in with them. We attended events like this many times during our 14-year marriage. My company sponsored a few parties a year, although none as sumptuous as this luxurious ballroom. With the growth of Sarah's company, they were having events like this several times a year. Some were simple department celebrations at a local bar and grill for happy hour. Others were expensive events such as this big party. Sarah considered the frequent celebrations a benefit of her employment and also a chance to network with other important people in her firm. I just tagged along and enjoyed the free food and drink. During the evening, Sarah and I were together most of the time. However, there were times when she was asked to dance by other men, and she usually accepted. I didn't mind because our relationship was solid. We both knew that cheating was completely unacceptable to both of us. After discussing it early in our marriage, the subject hardly ever came up again. I could tell that my wife was enjoying herself, and I was glad. Even in her 40s, my slim blonde wife had a nice figure and enjoyed dancing. She was still an attractive woman, and I loved her, even if she's a bit of a flirt. I saw her flirting as harmless and always assumed she'd attract men's attention whenever we went out in public. I'm two years younger than my 42-year-old wife and still in good shape. So, I was never jealous of her having a good time, even if she was dancing with other men. However, later into the night, my blissful attitude was shaken a little by something I noticed. Sarah had returned from the dance floor a few minutes earlier. She was sweating a little and was sipping her wine as we both sat silently watching the dancers on the floor. It was during that silent interlude that I felt a presence emerge from the crowded floor and advance directly to our table. Over the loud music a tall, rather large black man walked up to us and flashed me an insolent smirk. Then he smiled at my wife and silently held out his hand as if expecting her to immediately respond to his wordless offer. I was caught a little off guard by his arrogant, annoying gesture. As I turned to my wife to ask who was this creep was, I found her gazing up at him with a weird smirk on her face. Immediately my bullshit antennae went up. I hadn't seen that look in quite a while, but I was very familiar with it. That look is supposed to be reserved for her husband, alone. I had seen it directed at me when we were first married. But early in our marriage, I had noticed that look of lust on Sarah's face at one of the after-work parties we attended. It was directed at some young guy she knew, who I later found out she was having an inappropriate relationship with. A few weeks after that party when I caught her flashing the look of lust, 
I was very suspicious. That night we were at a bar and met up with her friends, and that same guy was there too. That night I noticed her drinking more than normal. When he asked her to dance, she again flashed that damn look of lust as he accompanied him to the floor. I watched her closely and found her dancing way too intimately with him. I pretended to drink too much and acted like I was nearly passing out as they flirted together. Later when she thought I was too drunk to notice, she snuck off with him using a back entrance. I found her in the guy's car making out with him, letting him feel up her tits. I didn't know how far they had gone or how far she intended to go. Probably all the way, I suppose. I let her continue her indecent activities and simply confronted her when she got home. I made it clear that I intended to divorce her if she didn't dump that asshole. She was shocked that I knew what she had done. She was also very apologetic and promised never to do that again. She said she loved me and that this guy was just a fun distraction, someone she knew from her past. She claimed he was just a guy she flirted with and got caught up in it and let it go too far. She said they never had sex, that she had already dumped him, and it would never happen again. I guess I believed her, but had a difficult time forgiving her. Also, the trust one had in her was definitely damaged. Our marriage was Sarah's second marriage as her short first marriage ended in divorce. This was my first time tying the knot, and I was flabbergasted she could disregard our marriage vows and behave this way. We did go to counseling, but it still took several months of therapy to get our marriage back on track. Now that look of lust was back on her face, and it wasn't meant for me. I watched helplessly as Sarah reached out her hand with that same yearning, lust-filled look on her face. It wasn't exactly a smile. Her face was beaming though and her thin lips were twisted in a subtle half-smile. As she gazed at him her blue eyes were twinkling. She eagerly accepted his request as she took his hand, rose from her seat, and without once looking at me left the table with him. As I sat there feeling quite left out, the big man covetously held her hand, and with a triumphant look, escorted my star-struck wife out onto the dance floor. I pulled my eyes away from them long enough to glance around the table and found the other couples just as interested as I was in what happened. It was a very awkward moment. I glanced around for some explanation from my table mates and found that none of them wanted to make eye contact with me. The couple next to me immediately got up and went to the bar. The woman next to me suddenly pulled her husband to his feet and led him out on the dance floor. I shot a few of them questioning glances to some who were still seated and realized very quickly that no one was going to clear up my confusion. I felt a pang of jealousy rise up inside me, but forced it down. I tried to rationalize my feelings, telling myself that my suspicions were absurd. Sarah loved me and I loved her. She had danced with other guys all night. Other than that, one mistake years ago, she had been a good, faithful wife and partner. I was positive she wouldn't do anything to jeopardize our marriage again. Surely after all these years she had learned that I would never accept any foolishness. For a moment my jealousy subsided. I took solace in the fact that we had built a solid, loving marriage over the years. But as I watched my slender, middle-aged wife dancing a fast song with her tall partner, I couldn't help noticing her adoring glances up at his dark face. Sarah is a good dancer, and her slim body moving sensuously around the tall man had drawn many people's attention. When the song ended, I breathed a sigh of relief. I expected her to thank the man for the dance, as she had done all night, and return to my side and the privacy of our table. Instead, as the next song came on, the man pulled my smiling wife into a close embrace for the next song was a slow, romantic one. It was obvious that neither of them had any intention of ending their dance. I wanted to go out and interrupt them, but I eventually decided to just let this play out. Her actions proved that she cared little about my opinion. As the man held her against his body, I noticed that his hands had drifted close to her buttocks, keeping her hips grinding against his. She didn't object to his embrace or wandering hands at all. On the contrary, she seemed to be enjoying herself very much. It was obvious she only had adoring eyes for her tall dance partner. I was pissed, but knew if she was doing something inappropriate again, I would find out soon enough. As the song continued, Sarah and her partner slowly drifted further into the crowded dance floor. I could no longer see them but had suspicions that whatever they were doing wasn't something she wanted me to see. When that song ended, another slow song started right away. As I expected, Sarah never came back. In fact, it was five more songs before the crowded dance floor thinned out, and I saw my flushed, giggling wife, still in a tight embrace, dancing with her friend. As I waited impatiently for her return, some of the couples at my table returned. They were still glancing sheepishly at me and acted like they were embarrassed about something. Unable to wait, I turned to the woman next to me and asked, who is the tall guy that Sarah is dancing with? I knew the woman worked with Sarah. 
She looked a bit agitated at my question. She cast me what I can only describe as a look of pity, before her expression softened. Then she sighed in resignation and answered my question. That's Mr. Jackson, the woman told me. He's the new assistant director of sales that started with the firm a few months ago. Jackson, huh? Does he have a first name? Trayvon. Trayvon Jackson. She answered, adding, Sarah works for him now. He's her boss. I blurted out with surprise. I wondered why my wife never told me about this. How long has she worked for him? I think it's been a few months. The woman said. Probably since he started working here. He's some ex-college athlete. Football, I think. He was sent from another office and seems to be a favorite of the CEO. Since he's been here, he's taken over another department and seems to be on a fast track to upper management. The woman then said she had to use the ladies' room and excused herself. I think she just wanted to get away from me before I questioned her further. The music was still playing, this time a fast song. When I scanned the dance floor, which had thinned out considerable, I couldn't see Sarah anywhere. Then I glanced around the room and spotted her at a table across from the dance floor sitting at Mr. Jackson's table. She had left me alone so she could join her black friend. I was pissed. There were several other couples at the table with them. Several black men and three white, giggling females. Sarah was laughing too at some amusing story that Jackson was telling the group. I made my way over to the table. There were empty shot glasses all around the large table, so I knew they were drinking, probably a lot. I could hear my wife saying something, and it sounded like she was slurring her words. As I approached them, Sarah saw me coming and her laughing suddenly stopped. Hi, honey. She called out as I grew closer. Her flushed face took on a more sober expression as she asked, Are you having fun, Carl? Sorry to leave you alone, darling. I'm just having a drink with my friends. Have you met Trayvon yet? I wasn't sure how to behave. Should I act like a clueless husband and just ignore her dismissive attitude toward me? Or should I make a scene, call her out in front of her so-called friends and her arrogant boss? I decided to take a middle road and acted a bit stiff as I consider her with a passive, curious expression. No, I haven't. With a chagrin look, Sarah rose and moved to my side. She introduced me to her friends at the table. They didn't get up and not one of them shook my hand. They all just waved and seemed quite amused by my presence. When she got around to introducing Jackson, the guy just squeezed my hand overly hard and with barely a nod in my direction and went back to ignoring me. The young woman next to him noticed the veiled insult and giggled. Without reacting to his insult, I announced, Well, it's getting late, Sarah. I'm tired now, and I'm ready to leave. Sarah was clearly surprised and irritated. Locking eyes with her, I asked, Are you coming, dear? No? Already? She exclaimed, sounding a little drunk. Yes, it's past midnight. I'm leaving right now. With a frown, she said, I don't want to leave yet, Carl. It's still early. Why don't you go back to our table and I'll join you in a few. I want to talk to Trayvon for a few minutes about something. Trayvon, I thought suspiciously. Not Mr. Jackson. She's sure acting friendly to a guy that she's working for. After ignoring me, dancing with him for the last half hour, and then drinking a shot or two at their table, it didn't seem like a normal business relationship. I was getting more upset. But instead of venting my frustration, I just shrugged and shot her a dismissive look. Do what you want, Sarah. But I'm leaving. As I spun around and walked away, I could hear snickering behind me. Somebody said laughing, just let him go, Sarah. I'll give you a ride home. I had my keys in my hand as I made my way rapidly toward the exit. Sarah's purse was still at our table. I knew she had to retrieve it before she left, so I was nearly to the parking lot when I heard my wife's high heels behind me clattering on the pavement. Damn it, Carl. Wait. She cried angrily. She finally caught up, grabbed my arm, and tried to pull me around. I nearly yanked her arm off as I pulled away from her grasp. I walked so fast to our car that she had a hard time keeping up in her high heels. Just get in. I told her gruffly as I opened my door. I unlocked her door after sliding behind the wheel. Usually, I'd open her door first as a gentleman should. But tonight, I was too upset and just waited until she trotted around the car, opened her own door and slid into her seat. That was so rude. She cried in a shrill tone. What the hell's the matter with you, Carl? Everybody was laughing at how you behaved. I have to work with those people, you know. It's not even that late yet, and the band is still playing. What's wrong anyway? I didn't want to tell her that my suspicions were tripped when I noticed her look of lust for her asshole boss. I just mumbled something that I was tired, and I wasn't having a very good time watching her dancing with other guys. She complained about my impolite behavior for a while. But when she saw that I wasn't going to discuss the matter with her, she dropped it 
and we spent the rest of the ride home in tense silence. That night was the beginning of our problems. For the rest of the weekend, Sarah acted upset with me. We didn't speak very much. I did ask her why she never told me she now worked for an obnoxious, young black guy. She frowned and her bitter response proved she didn't appreciate me demeaning her new boss. I guess she held the shithead in much higher regard than I did. During the next week, things improved a little. Sarah was still not going to admit that she had a crush on her boss. But I knew from that look that she did. She said she'd been moved into his department to work as his assistant and didn't mention him because she didn't think I was interested in something so trivial. She was probably right about that. But that was before I saw her look of lust and the way the two were dirty dancing that night at the hotel. Things settled down over the next couple weeks. We had sex once or twice, but there was no real emotion in it. It was hardly making love. I hoped Sarah would realize how much I cared for her and would respect my feelings about cheating. When we did broach the subject of her inappropriate behavior that night, and she grew irritated and defensive. You're just being childish, Carl. She accused me. I have always danced with other men at parties and you never minded before. Your boss is different. I replied. You two weren't dancing like friends that night. His hands were wandering a little too much, and you didn't seem to mind one bit. Oh, you poor man. She laughed. Maybe I did let him touch my ass. But so what? It meant nothing. Just a bit of fun you know. You sound so damn insecure. Are you going to be jealous every time I dance with some guy now? No. Just him. I don't like the way he acts around you. You mean because he's an attractive younger man that notices I'm not so old or so bad looking? She snapped back at me. Or is it some racial thing you don't like him because he's black? Her insolent smirk was hard to take. She knew very well that I was no racist. I just hated to see her acting like a love-struck teenager around some arrogant prick that seemed to be interested in getting into her panties. That has nothing to do with it. I said, barely keeping control. Well, whatever has you all charged up, you better get over it. I've been working for Trayvon for over two months now, and he's been a great boss. He's made it very clear that he appreciates my work. He gave me a bonus last month and has even put me up for a raise. That was news. Before I could react to that, she added quickly, Oh, and by the way, Carl, I'm scheduled to go on a customer visit with Trayvon and two other sales reps the week after next. Really? I snorted. Less than two weeks from now. That's pretty short notice, don't you think? When did old Trayvon plan that trip, my dear? The other night when you were dancing with him? It's been in the works for a while. She admitted, I was going to tell you after the party, but you were moping around like a jerk, so I didn't. I've been waiting until you got over your little snit to let you know. So, you and Trayvon are off together, huh? That's convenient. I shot back. I guess you two will have lots of time to drink and dance while you're away from your boring old husband. How long will this trip last anyway? Sarah shot me a bitter glare and said, We leave Wednesday, and I think we get back Sunday morning. A whole weekend? Why don't you come back Friday night? We have important meetings with the customer on Saturday. I think they're going to sign a big contract with us, and Trayvon is going to be the lead rep for our company. It's a big deal, and he says he needs me there to assist with things. Damn it, Sarah. Can't you see that bastard is just trying to screw you? I could tell by the way she acted he's just another kitty hound on the make. No, he's not. You're just acting like a jealous fool. A fool, huh? Tell you what, my loving wife, I want you to go to work tomorrow and ask HR for a transfer out of his department. He's just setting you up for an affair, and I won't stand by and do nothing while he screws up our marriage. Her eyes widened in surprise. I don't think she expected that. I will not. You're crazy, Carl. This is the best job I ever had. I won't give it up. Oh, no. That's right. Forget it. I'm not quitting just so you'll feel better. You better get over this jealous shit right now. I'm making more money than ever and I'm not leaving my job. Trayvon is treating me with the respect I deserve and I'm not doing anything to mess it up. You better not either. That declaration ended our discussion. I tried complaining some more. But Sarah wouldn't listen and just shut me out. She marched out of the house, her purse in her hand, went to her car and started to drive off. I chased her outside. Where are you going? I shouted. We're not finished. Oh yes we are. I'm going out to dinner with Mary until you stop being such an insecure jerk. She told me bitterly. I'll give you time to get your head out of your ass, and maybe we can talk then. As she left in a huff, I slumped down in my recliner feeling depressed. How quickly our relationship had devolved into arguing and suspicions. Was she going to start cheating on me again? I still remember the old saying, once a cheater, always a cheater. But after so many years together, I could hardly believe she was going to screw up again.
Of course, I didn't actually catch her fucking that asshole many years ago, but she certainly behaved like she did. Now that I'd seen her with her boss, giving him that look that was reserved for me, I didn't trust her one bit. And she made it clear she didn't care what I thought. I guess the usual next step is for the suspicious husband to hire a private detective to put video cameras in her hotel room to get the evidence of her cheating. Then using that evidence go to a lawyer and sue her for every sin I could get. Afterward, I should reveal my martial arts training and challenge her boss to a fight and beat him to within an inch of his life. Unfortunately for me, I didn't have the funds to hire an expensive PI. I wasn't a trained SEAL and had no army buddies to take him out. I also never took any martial arts training. In fact, I haven't had a serious physical fight since I was in middle school. But I knew that despite my lack of resources to punish my wife and her lover, I wasn't going to stay married to a cheating, lying slut. I only had my suspicions so far. But the insolent way he behaves toward me was no illusion. I knew that look of lust on her face was proof something was going on in her head. If she hadn't fucked him yet, that guy was going to make every effort to do so. The week before she left on her trip with Jackson, we were in a silent tug of war over her job. Sarah is a strong-willed person, and so am I. Neither of us wanted to give in or apologize, her for her bad attitude and her flirty behavior, and me for accusing her of being too cozy with her boss. The weekend before her trip her approach toward me softened. She started speaking kindly during our meals. She came home on time, and if I didn't have supper cooking, she would fix us dinner. After work she changed from her office where into some skimpy shorts and revealing tops. We hadn't had sex in nearly two weeks, and I was definitely horny. I saw her prancing around in her skimpy clothing and knew she was trying to seduce me before her trip, probably so she could leave without a guilty conscience. I admit I was turned on by my slender wife's subtle beauty. Sarah is no supermodel, and I'm no Brad Pitt either. She is however intelligent, attractive, and her slim body is still pretty nice for a 42-year-old woman. She has firm breasts, a fairly flat tummy, and long shapely legs, which were on full display in the tiny shorts she would wear. I was angry she couldn't see my point of view and wanted nothing more than to get our relationship back to the loving marriage we enjoyed for so long. I was debating whether I should just give in or pout and hold out until she agreed with me. The worst thought was that if we didn't have sex, she'd be so horny on her trip she'd be easy pickings for a sleazy jerk like Jackson to take advantage of. So, the last night before she left, I finally gave in and we had sex. I wanted to make slow, romantic love with my wife. But it ended up being a pretty frantic session. My frustrations were sated but my suspicions were not. It was early Wednesday morning of her trip when she began packing her suitcase. At 9 o'clock sharp the taxi came to take her to the airport. I wanted to drive her but I had to work that day. I left a little late so I could kiss her goodbye and wish her luck. Inside I was dreading this trip. But by now there was nothing I could do. When her bags were loaded in the taxi, Sarah turned to me with a perplexed look. Don't worry, Carl. She said, I love you, darling. Only you. Last night was so wonderful. Thank you for trusting me. You have nothing to worry about. I hope not. I love you too, baby, so much. I told her truthfully. I'm gonna miss you a lot. Me too, my love. But please don't be jealous. Nothing will bad will happen, I promise. It's just a business trip, nothing more. Before you know it, I'll be back home in your arms and we can continue what we started last night. As she drove away, there was a painful knot in my chest. Despite her promises, I knew that her ship boss would be after her. He was a sleazebag and was just leading my gullible wife on. I only hoped she would smarten up before that guy ruined our wonderful relationship. Wednesday night was tough. Sarah realized how nervous I was and called me twice that day. Once when she arrived at her hotel, and again that evening after she had dinner with her co-workers. I deliberately didn't mention anything about her asshole boss. We just chatted about how nice her room was and how excited she was to have a part in the negotiations with her clients. She said she appreciated the responsibility that her boss had given her and she would try to do her best. I just told her in a relaxed tone that was nice. Then we exchanged, I love you, and hung up. I could hardly sleep at all that night. Thursday at work I was useless. I messed up a couple orders and my manager chewed me out. I hated screwing up. But I was so nervous about Sarah's trip I could hardly think straight. My wife called on my cell phone in the early evening. I kept telling her I loved her until she nearly started laughing at me. I loved the sound of her voice and I hated to hang up. By Friday, I couldn't take it anymore. My manager found a few mistakes I made and he wasn't pleased. I told him I wasn't feeling well and he told me to get out because I was worthless today. I left work early and went straight home. 
On the way home, I called Ribbled Consulting and asked to speak to Trayvon Jackson. His secretary told me he was unavailable on a business trip and he'd be back on Monday. I told her I was a friend of his family and wanted to give him an important message. She wouldn't give me his cell phone number, but she did let it slip what hotel he was staying at. It was a residence inn, and I quickly got the number from a Google search. I didn't have the money for a full-blown investigation of my wife's activities on her trip, but I did have a credit card and enough available funds to charge an airline ticket for Saturday morning. I wanted to get one for Friday night, but they were all booked up. Since I knew Sarah would be there Saturday night, I figured that would be enough time to calm my fears that nothing was going on. At least I hoped so. I was nervous as hell on my flight. I caught the flight attendants giving me a suspicious eye, probably wondering why I looked so jittery. Once I got there, I rented a small compact car at the airport and arrived at the residence at around 11 o'clock in the morning. Sarah led me to believe that she had meetings with her clients every day including Saturday. That was why she couldn't return until Sunday morning. But when I got out of my car, I glanced over at the swimming pool and my heart nearly broke. There was my wife in a skimpy bikini, stretched out on a lounge chair next to her black boss. On a small table by her chair was a tall drink, probably a mimosa. Sitting very close to her side was Trayvon chatting and sipping a cold mixed drink of his own. They were with another couple. Probably the other co-workers that Sarah had mentioned would be going on this trip. By the way Trayvon was holding court, it was clear he was the boss. His voice was so loud it was easy to hear him from across the parking lot. He was telling my wife and the other couple an amusing story and she was laughing like a hyena. It was still morning, but she already seemed a little drunk. I moved my car to the other side of the building and then walked back around to the entrance. Making sure that my wife and the others didn't notice me, I went inside to the welcome desk. I showed the female receptionist my driver's license and asked her for a room key to Sarah Sorensen's room. She checked to make sure I was her husband and then gave it to me. Have a nice stay with us, Mr. Sorensen. She said cheerfully. I hid my disgust and replied, I sure will, and proceeded straight to her room. What I found verified all of my fears. Sarah said she was sharing a room with another woman. But I can see that wasn't true by the open suitcases and all of the pants, ties and suit jackets that were clearly men's wear. I did recognize Sarah's clothes mixed in with some sexy undies that I've never seen before. The beds were already made up, so the maid had already been there. I looked out the window and found I had a clear view of the swimming area. There was a dozen or so people in and around the pool. Just a few adults and kids, probably families. I watched Sarah and her group. She was drinking her mimosa and smiling as if she was having the time of her life. The other couple with them was similar in that the woman was white and looked around Sarah's age, while the guy she was with was a considerably younger black man. I didn't know either of them, but assumed they were probably cheaters like Sarah. I gritted my teeth at how relaxed and comfortable my wife was around her new boyfriend. When she turned onto her stomach, I took out my cell phone and began to video record them. Sarah was wearing a sexy bikini that was new to me. It was pretty revealing and the bottoms left about half of her tight ass visible. It was pretty racy attire for this family-style venue. When Trayvon reached over and picked up a tube of sunscreen and began rubbing it on her back, I nearly flipped out. Somehow, I held it together. I stood there feeling sick, recording the two couples as the guys rubbed lotion on the women's bodies, leaving them glistening in the hot sun. After a minute, Sarah flipped over and let that bastard stroke more oil onto her legs. When he finished, they shared an intimate kiss. Sarah couldn't have looked more pleased. I recorded 15 minutes or so. Then I checked around the room to see what I could find. I looked through her suitcase and was shocked at all the revealing undies, dresses and nighties she had brought. It was like she was going to a stripper convention. In Trayvon's suitcase, I found a 12-pack of rubbers. There were only four rubbers left. So, unless he's sharing them with his friend, he's already screwed my wife eight times over the past week. That gave me an idea. I went back to the lobby and asked the receptionist if there was a sewing kit I could have. She directed me to a coin machine around the corner that had some emergency items you might need on a trip. Along with toothpaste, toothbrushes, nail clippers, and other such items was a small sewing kit for emergencies. I quickly purchased it and went straight back to the room. I checked outside and saw that Sarah and her group of cheaters was still by the pool. Then I took a needle from the sewing kit and poked tiny holes in all of the rubbers. They were so tiny, I didn't think anyone would notice. I knew Sarah wasn't on the pill because she had a reaction to whatever drug was in them. She used a diaphragm for birth control and also some spermicide just to make sure she didn't get pregnant. 
I searched her luggage and found her diaphragm and poked three tiny holes in the side rim of the device. Her can of spermicide was next to it, so I emptied nearly all of it into the toilet and flushed it down the drain. I didn't want to completely drain the can because she might realize that it had been tampered with. I left just enough for her to get a tiny bit before it ran out. My hope was that they would be too anxious to have sex to worry about it. I was pretty sure that old Trayvon would blow a big load in her and was betting that there wasn't nearly enough of the spermicide to prevent pregnancy. I couldn't be sure, but I was hoping that would be the case. Time would tell. The last thing I did was to damage the curtain rod a little, making it impossible to completely close it all the way. Since her room was on the first floor, I had an idea I could get some video of them screwing through a small opening in the curtain. I checked it repeatedly and when I finished, I was sure it wouldn't close all the way. I was hoping they'd be so hot to screw, they wouldn't take the time to make sure the curtain was all the way closed. When I left home, I just wanted to convince myself that Sarah was a faithful wife and I could calm down. Now that I found she wasn't, I wanted to do more to screw up their trip. But I was so nervous they would return and catch me in their room I couldn't think quick enough. If I had more time to think and plan, I could have done more, like setting up video cameras or stealing Trayvon's company credit card and charging it up. Oh well. I had done a few things and I quickly got out of there before my presence was discovered. I moved my car to a more secluded spot and just sat there for a while. I could see the pool area and watch for another hour as my wife and that jerk-off drank, laughed, played in the pool and basically carried on like newlyweds. I didn't want to stay too long for fear something may go wrong. I was delighted when the four of them gathered up their towels and went back into the hotel. It was early afternoon and I could only suspect that they were in there screwing. So, I crept up to their window, started my video recorder on my phone and held it up to the window. As I suspected, they were already going at it. Not only was Sarah and Trayvon screwing on the bed next to the window, but next to them the other couple was having sex in the same room. The young black guy was pounding that old floozy like his life depended on it on the other bed. I made a note to find out who that woman is and if she was married, to have a talk with her husband. It was broad daylight so I knew I was taking a chance at being discovered. But I was only there for less than 15 minutes and in that time, no one seemed to notice me standing there. I didn't look at my phone to see what I was recording, because I didn't want to look too suspicious. I just acted like I was checking something out on the wall next to the window and no one seemed to care. I could hear a loud groaning from inside. So just before I left, I glanced inside and my heart nearly stopped. There was my lovely Sarah, on her knees, being screwed from both ends by the two guys. Trayvon was in front of her her short blonde hair in his fist, jamming his tool into her face. The other guy was busy behind her, just as vigorously as he pounded the other woman on the bed earlier. The other woman was sitting on the bed watching with a horny smirk on her face. Sarah was squealing deliriously about her wild threesome. It made me wonder if this was her first time. Probably not. After pounding her for another minute or so, Sarah acted a little dizzy. She was very unstable as the guys grabbed her and forcefully flipped her on her back. The guys then switched positions. She looked like a disgusting slut in a corn movie and I felt my heart breaking all over again. I could hardly believe this was my wife being double teamed like the biggest 304 in town. I turned off the recorder and quickly left the area before anyone saw me. I flew home and was sitting in my recliner watching TV when Sarah's taxi pulled up in front of the house. I'd been stealing my nerves all day to keep a normal appearance and not make her suspicious. When she entered the house, she seemed to be in a great mood. I got up and hugged her to welcome her back. She squealed. Oh my darling, I missed you so much. Did you have a nice trip, honey? I asked pleasantly. Oh yes, it was nice. It was also very lucrative for our company. We managed to get them to sign an exclusive contract. She told me eagerly. It was a nice trip, but I missed you so much. I missed you too, Sarah. I lied. She flashed a flirtatious smirk thrust out her chest and batted her eyes. I hope you did love her. We have some unfinished business to attend to. She said in a suggestive manner. I know this trip was tough for you, Carl. She continued. I hated being away from you too. I'm glad you put up with me and I plan to reward you for your patience. I did miss you so much and hope you saved up your energy because I plan to give you everything you want tonight. That's nice. I mean it. You just wait, baby. She said as she tried to kiss me on the lips. At the last second, I turned my head and gave her my cheek instead. That seemed to surprise her. She looked at me funny, but didn't mention it. That's very generous of you, Sarah. Let me help you with your luggage. I told her calmly, quickly disengaging from her embrace and grabbing her suitcase. 
I went up the stairs and lay it on the bed. Sarah tried to hold me and kiss me again, making it clear what she wanted to do. I just returned her hug, then gently pushed her away and left the room, letting her unpack by herself. She looked a little confused why I was acting distant with her. I had already fixed something for her to eat, and she was grateful. I guess she used up a lot of energy screwing Trayvon and his buddy. She told me about her trip and the meetings she attended. Not surprisingly, there was very little mention of her new boyfriend boss. I guess she knew I didn't like him, so why even bring him up? She did thank me for not fussing about her trip and letting her gain some much-needed experience in business negotiations. I just nodded and kept quiet about how I really felt. I knew Sarah was anxious to get me into bed, probably to soothe her guilty conscience. But I wasn't going to take sloppy seconds from those black guys. There was no way I was putting my dick into that putrid hole, condom or not. After we ate, I told her I had some work to do in my office. She looked at me like she wasn't sure what I said. I know she didn't expect to be rejected, but she was already drilled out and wasn't that horny anyway. She just nodded and told me that she'd be happy to wait until later. I'd have had a tough time fighting her off without some help. So after dinner, I opened a bottle of wine. Sarah accepted a glass gratefully. I sat down on the sofa and turned on the TV. She dropped down next to me, sipping her wine and leaning her head on my shoulder. I just waited for the wine to do its job. I knew she would be tired after her trip with those guys. But I couldn't be sure that she'd be sleepy enough to stop going after me. When we both finished our first glass, I got up and refilled both of them. But this time, I dropped two sleeping pills in hers. She didn't even finish the second glass before she dropped off to sleep. She tried to keep her eyes open. But it was no use. By 10 o'clock, she was passed out. I just left her on the sofa and put a blanket over her. Then I went to bed and had the first good night of sleep in weeks. I left before she woke up in the morning. We didn't speak until Monday night. I pulled that trick a couple more times over the next few weeks. I made it a point to reject Sarah whenever she made it clear she wanted sex. Let her get it from her a-hole boss, I figured. But on the nights when we'd share some wine and she'd get sleepy, I would mount her and pretend to have sex. She just acted like she knew what was happening. When I apologized for my lack of control, she just said I could have her any time I wanted. That worked for me. I just needed to make sure I could resist my cheating wife's advances. She is still sexy and I was horny as hell. Not from the images of her being double teamed. Those memories made me sick and would be the death of our marriage. I've never been the type of weirdo that gets off on watching my wife screwing some idiot. No. I needed my revenge and those sick images only fueled my anger at her and my intense hatred of her boss. After she returned, I tried to act like a normal husband. It was very difficult for me because I knew we were headed for divorce. I already decided I could never trust this cheating bitch, and we were through. I just acted like a clueless idiot, and we chatted casually over dinner about her day. Sometimes we made plans for the weekend, going out for dinner at a restaurant she liked. I even took her dancing a couple times. We spoke about her job and both of our career aspirations. But there was no more talk of her quitting her job or transferring out of Trayvon's department. She didn't mention it either and was glad that I didn't bring it up anymore. After her weekend away, we did resume our affectionate behavior. I had to keep things normal so she didn't suspect what I had planned. If we went out, I would hold her hand and open doors for her. When we're home, I'd rub her back or her feet or hold her and nuzzle her neck. She liked that. There wasn't any making out but sometimes I'd kiss her after she brushed her teeth before coming to bed. That was the only time, because I worried who else she was kissing, not to mention what kind of filthy tool she was sucking. It was almost a month later when she informed me that she was going on another business trip. I had to grip my teeth and bite my tongue to keep from yelling out my frustrations. She was going to cheat on me again. Keeping a steady attitude, I purposely didn't ask if Trayvon was going. Since she didn't tell me one way or the other, I assumed he was. I acted sad to have her away from me, but I wasn't nearly as adamant about her not going as I was before her first trip. By now I accepted that she was continuing her affair, and no amount of pleading would get me anything except denials. It broke my heart that she was throwing away 14 years of a happy marriage. But there was nothing I could do about that. What Sarah didn't know was that I had already contacted a lawyer. I had slowly moved what little money we had into an account in my name only. I was ready to cut off our credit cards our cell phone service, and any other shared financial arrangements between us. She thought she was fooling me and was going to screw her a whole boyfriend, but this time I was ready. I discussed with my lawyer the best time to have her served. He suggested we do it when she was on her trip, but I decided to have it done before her trip, at her office where all of her co-workers could watch. 
I still remember all the pitying glances they gave me on the night of her company's party. They all considered me a clueless fool, too stupid to realize some a-hole was banging my wife. We'll see about that. She was supposed to leave for her trip on Wednesday. So, I had her served in her office the Monday before. Enclosed in the packet were several incriminating still shots I pulled from the video I took. They left no doubt about her sordid affair. I would also have her boss served for alienation of affection. In the suit were more photos of their affair, and also a description of their adulterous activities when on the business trip sponsored by her company. She and her boss were cheating on that trip and were using the company credit card to fund their affair. I was sure that would get her upper management's attention. If that didn't raise a fuss, then the lawsuit against her company would. We sued their company for not enforcing the morals clause of her hiring contract. We had affidavits of her co-workers who said they carried on their affair with the full knowledge of dozens of people. At 10 o'clock Monday morning, I received a call on my cell phone. Hello? I said calmly, knowing it was my wife. You effing, stupid jerk. Sarah screeched into my ear. Good morning to you too, darling. What the hell did you do? She cried in anger. You asshole. This is, oh damn you Carl. I can't. Why embarrass me in front of the whole office? You mean like you've been doing to me for the past few months, cheater? I replied with venom. You've been effing that bastard even after I told you what he was after. You're just too stupid to listen. I heard her sob for a moment. Then there was silence before she spoke. Carl, I don't know what you're thinking. I'm thinking you want to replace me, bitch. Do you love him? Love him? She cried in disbelief. Well, do ya? You're screwing him. She let out a demonic laugh, then snarled. Oh, that's so effing funny, you stupid jerk. I don't love him, you idiot. I love you. I've always loved you. Trayvon's just helping me in my career. That's it. He's a means to an end. He means nothing to me. Nothing. The sex was just a little distraction. You haven't been doing your job in the bedroom, so I guess I needed a little entertainment on the side. In a calmer tone, she said, we can get past this. Don't do this to us. There's no reason for a divorce. I feel like you just threw away a pretty good marriage. I didn't. I just lost my head for a while, honey. Please, let's talk about this. Don't do anything rash, baby. I'm coming home right now so we can talk. Don't bother. I don't want to see you, Sarah. I had the locks changed. Your key won't work. If you check the paperwork, you'll find an order of protection against you and your filthy boss. Just stay away. Please, let's talk, Carl. We can get past this. I know I screwed up. But you can't be serious about just kicking me out after so many years. I warned you, bitch, and you didn't listen. But I'm listening now. I love you. I'll always love you. I was about to say more. But there were some noises on her end. I could hear some guy telling her to accompany him to go somewhere. I figure her management team has already gotten my lawsuit and needed to speak to her. Listen, Carl. Someone is telling me I have to go. But we have to talk about this later. Just remember I love you. I'll call you back. And the call ended just like that. My marriage was history. I set my phone down and the tears started to fall. I loved the damn, cheating bitch, even if she treated me like shit. It was hard to believe that I'd have to live without her now. I felt like guzzling a bottle of liquor to forget my troubles. But inside I knew that wouldn't help anything. I found out later that Trayvon Jackson lost his job that very day. Apparently, he had been transferred to Sarah's location after another sexual harassment issue at his previous office. He was a well-known former athlete and the CEO liked him and didn't want to just dismiss him. But after my lawsuit, they just figured to cut their losses and got rid of the sleazy jerk. It took a couple more days before Sarah was also fired. I guess too many people knew about her affair. The company was worried about the public relations of having such unfaithful employees on their payroll. I heard she did try to get into the house. But as she began banging on the door, frantic to get in, one of our neighbors called the cops. They were already aware of the protection order against her. To keep from being arrested, she agreed to leave the premises. What really stirred the pot was when my lawyer insisted that our lawsuit was for adultery. At first, Sarah's attorney tried to argue that there was no proof of any affair and it should be for irreconcilable differences. That's when my lawyer told them he already went to the court for an injunction to have her tested for pregnancy. I thought Sarah was going to faint on the spot. She angrily denied that she was pregnant and actually tried to slap my lawyer for saying so. I just sat there and laughed. We weren't sure that she was actually expecting, but I was sure that her pee-head boss had been doing her regularly. Since I never let any of my sperm into her body, if she was pregnant, it wasn't my kid. We still didn't let them see the video I recorded of her threesome with those two guys in the hotel. 
We were saving that for leverage in case she wouldn't go along with our demands. I was asking for a 60-40th split of our assets, with me getting the 60%. Also, no alimony. Her lawyer smugly informed us that we were only going to get half, and since I made more money than her, alimony was a foregone conclusion. We just waited them out. It was two weeks later when we received a counter-offer from Sarah's lawyer. He let us know that she was indeed pregnant, but she insisted that I was the father and would have to pay for the child. We were also informed that it had to be a 50-50 split of the assets and they would be insisting on alimony or we'd go before a judge to figure it out. In the meantime, her lawyer got the protection order lifted and Sarah was allowed to enter our house with a sheriff to get her personal belongings. She also was allowed to get half of our money back. I agreed to both conditions. When she arrived at our house, my lawyer was there, but I wasn't. He told me that she was upset that I wasn't there because she wanted to talk to me. He just told her that wasn't the deal and she had one hour to get her things and then get out. Six weeks after she was served, I got a call from Sarah. Unlike the first time we spoke, this time her attitude was very conciliatory. Hello, Carl. Can I speak to you, please? What is it? I just want you to know that I'm so terribly sorry for everything. I know it was all my fault, and I wish you would let me speak to you in person. I don't think that's a good idea, Sarah. My lawyer says. Oh, screw your lawyer, Carl. I'm your wife. At least for a while. Why can't we sit down and discuss the situation like adults? I know I fucked up badly, and I'm so incredibly sorry for everything. There was a pause, and I could hear her sobbing a little. You know I lost my job. Yes. I heard. And, and, now that everybody know, about... My affair, it's going to be real hard for me to find work. Everybody blames me and, oh shit, I said I wouldn't cry anymore but. I let her cry for a few moments before I responded. Sarah, we have nothing to talk about anymore. You wanted to screw your sleazy boss more than you wanted to remain faithful to me. I don't hate you for that. But I can't live with a woman that treats me so badly. How can I ever trust you again? You know this isn't the first time we've had this problem. I know, but I still love you. I miss you so much. Can't you just let me talk to you for a while? I know you loved me once. You could love me again. And think about our baby. I know it's yours. You're going to be a father, Carl. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Don't you want to take care of your child? I let out a big sigh. I really did love her, once. Tell you what, Sarah. I know you're pregnant. Yes. I want to have your baby. We can work this out. Think about our child. Okay. If my lawyer agrees, let's have a DNA test done. I don't want to give you any false hope of us working this out. But if the child is mine, that will change everything. I have to know. Oh yes, honey. She exclaimed. That's all I'm asking for. Just give me a chance to make it right. We can still be a family. I know I'm a little old to be a mother. But it won't matter if we're together. I promise to be the best mother and wife you'll ever see. Okay, Sarah. I'll talk to my lawyer and set it up. Oh, thank you, darling. Thank you. You won't regret this, Carl. You'll see. I love you so much. I hung up the phone. I know it was cruel, but I had to end this. Stringing her along would be even more cruel. There was no going back and she needed to know. We found out a week later that the baby wasn't mine. I knew it all along, but I needed Sarah to know too. To say she was upset was an understatement. She called me again, but spent nearly the whole conversation crying and saying she was sorry. I just hung up on her. My suit against her company resulted in a large cash payment, as long as I kept the details of my wife's affair quiet. My lawyer took a huge cut, but there was still plenty of money left over. I did send them information about the other two cheaters on that business trip. I heard later that both of them were fired too. I debated whether to find out if the other woman was married. But at this point, I was pretty disgusted with the whole thing and decided to drop it. On the date of our final divorce settlement, I showed up at the courthouse and saw my ex-wife. She was wearing maternity clothes and her belly had swollen up until it was huge. She looked like she had gained 50 pounds. She saw me from across the room as she waddled into her seat by her lawyer. She waved at me and flashed a nervous smile. I just nodded and turned my attention to the judge. He ordered the divorce to go through the way it was written, which was for me to get the 60% and pay no alimony. I did feel sorry for Sarah because her boyfriend had skipped town, as I always thought he was a useless, slimeball loser. Now he was also a deadbeat dad. Despite her lawyer's efforts, they couldn't find him. When the gavel sounded, our divorce was final. No one really made out in the end. I loved my wife and hated losing her. 
I was probably too old and too depressed at what happened to find another woman who I could build a close loving relationship with. Yeah, I'm just entering my 40s. But finding a woman you can love and trust isn't that easy. I did date a few times, but nothing ever clicked for me. After a while, I just about gave up. Sarah didn't end up well either. After our divorce was final, she went into a deep state of depression. We sold our house and split the profit 60 40ths, as was how our settlement decreed. The split left her with enough to get a small apartment, but the money was soon gone. She never had any education and she now works in a grocery store, sweeping floors and cleaning toilets. Her parents are trying to help her out, but she hasn't been eating well. I heard later that she lost the baby due to bad health and maybe her age. I saw her once a while later and she looked terrible. I used to think she was attractive, but now she had a perpetual depressed look on her face. Her hair's going gray, her body's skinny and shapeless. The harsh wrinkles on her face that used to be faint are now deep lines and make her look like she's in her 60s instead of her 40s. I don't think I saw her smile once. A year or so later, I heard she has found a guy. That's better than me as I'm still alone and bitter about it. They aren't living together. He's a lot older than her, but they do date sometimes. At least that's what I heard. I no longer have any animosity to Sarah. Life has treated her badly. I do hope she ends up finding someone that can love and trust her. I know I can't. I know divorce sucks. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.